Paul, I am super, super excited to have the two of you on here. Um, this is, uh, so you should know that um, I, I, I'm, I'm with my, uh, my co-founder, Steve Tuck, um, and I'm with my close colleague, Adam Leventhal, and all three of us are definitely our baseball fans. In fact, I did not grow up a baseball fan at all. And baseball, I have to say, and this is why I was hoping that we will get some folks here who are actually not baseball fans, because I was in your shoes as an adult. I grew up in Denver before the Rockies were there, and I just couldn't understand why people got into baseball. Like the idea of like traveling around to every ballpark in the country just struck me as like a mental illness, honestly, I gotta say. I just it sounded deranged. And Adam, I think the first like eye-opening baseball game I went to was with you, actually. Adam, you're a Red Sox fan. I am. Um, and you are in the, what's the line in Connecticut that, design, that divides Red Sox fans from Yankees? Because it's got a the name, Munson, right? The Munson-Nixon line. The Munson. uh, Thurman Munson and Trot Nixon. So it's the line down the Connecticut Munson. that divides the Yankees fans from the Red Sox fans. God, but not firmly I, enough, I would say. You know, move over, Wikipedia. Adam is is with you on the Connecticut knowledge, celebrating <laughs> the the victory of your UConn Huskies. Um, right. So you are on the Red Sox side of that line. Grew up a baseball fan. Well, and, actually, I'm I'm right I'm right on that line, but my dad oh. is from from the Boston area, so I definitely grew up big Red Sox fan uh, to the point where my friends would come over with Yankees hats, and my dad would force them to leave them outside at our house. You your friend can come in, but the hat may not. The hat no, must stay outside. There are a lot of people who uh, who I tell that to, and they're like, "Your dad's horrible," and uh, but the Red Sox fans are like, "That makes sense." That's the, the Red Sox fans would be like tough but fair. You, that's good that's parenting. Right. That's you reasonable. Were, raised right. right. Exactly. Take off your shoes. Take off your hat. Yeah, it's just, you're right. allowed to come into the, uh, the the Yankees fan is allowed to come into the house. Like that's pretty flexible. Yeah, the shoes soil yeah. the house. The hat soils the house. So this made no <laughs> sense to me growing up. All of this made no sense to me. And I growing it up, be said you were a sports fan. I was a sports fan, but I was, but Denver's a football town, and so the I and I and it was only as uh, and Steve, you grew up in the Bay, Giants fan, Giants fan. Uh, went to games in the stick, grew up in the stick in the in the eighties, in the eighties. Will Clark showed up. I was I really you didn't even let me. I like oh, we, need, we need to start the countdown clock to when Will the Thrill Clark is going to be mentioned. I literally couldn't even <laughs> get that sentence out, and you're already mentioning Will the Thrill Clark. So good memories. Um, so again, all of this just sounded odd to me. And Adam, you and I went to an A's game, an A's Red Sox game, um, in 2012. And I at the time, my oldest son had just basically fallen in love with baseball, um, a love affair that has has persisted and endured. And uh, we went to that game and you were explaining a bunch of the game to me. And like, I didn't, you know, what a slider was and what a curveball was. Uh, and it was, and that was 2012. And Paul and Brian, I think you were probably A's fan. I know you are both are A's fans. That season was just extraordinary. And it was, what a great first season to be a baseball fan. And the, and it was just like the whole thing about baseball was just it was it was it was eye opening and exuberant and it felt like the eighties experience was such a great experience and so that baseball kind of got into my DNA and we don't talk about it too frequently here because we know that not everyone's a sports fan but I I definitely I, I understand why people look at this and just like perplexed but it's a great sport and it's so much fun to watch with people I I love the fact it's got this the it's a sport you can nerd out about like this is the original nerd sport Adam do you think it isn't fair to say um I mean yeah the, the absolutely the like the and everything else yeah the obsession with statistics and uh I don't know, I mean I know there's lots of other fantasy leagues but I feel like you know one of my experiences baseball was waking up and looking at the box scores from the night before and sort of reliving the game in this ridiculous textual format. Which is amazing, right? The fact that you can kind of look at a box score and know what happens. And it was, it, it's, it, and it's also just a great way to bond with people. And the thing I love about baseball, I think kind of unlike other sports is it's really easy to be a fan of the sport, to go to a game. And Adam, you and I have been to a lot of games together and it's just fun to go watch a game, even though you are both supporting opposite teams. Although actually, so Brian and Paul, Adam and I worked together for Sean and I as no hitter. Those of you who don't know baseball, a no hitter is when the 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 team uh, the uh, uh, never gets a hit over the course of the game. The pitcher is able to go through the entire game without the other team ever getting a hit and getting on base as a result of a hit. And I had never seen a no hitter, of course. Adam, you had never seen a no hitter, of course. No. And 
we are in the, we are in the ninth inning with two outs. And I remember Adam, I looked at you and I'm like, this is your first no hitter. It's like, yeah, this would be my first no hitter. I'm like, is there any part of you that wants the A's to get a no hitter? He's like, <laughs> no part of me. I 100% want the Red Sox to get a hit right now. Uh, it, it's no, like, I remember, I remember that so distinctly. Hanley Ramirez was the first at bat. And I said, knock it out of the park, Hanley. And you turned to me and you're How like, dare you, you're sir. a terrible person. You like you said that to me. Person. The, the yeah. funny thing about no hitters is is that it's like exciting in theory, but it's actually a pretty boring baseball game because <laughs> it's a no very boring baseball game. It's so fast. You're watching the whole game and no one gets a hit. That's the whole point of the no hitter. So like all the excitement of baseball is people getting hit bases and moving around and like you miss all that. So like it's exciting after it happens, but during the game, it's actually the worst worst game to see. Well, I, although I will say it was pretty I mean, riveting at the there, time. There, was are some, great. there are some moments where you've got like Gregor Blanco's catch and Matt Cain's perfect game. Like the def- everyone hanging on every pitch and every play because you're waiting for a defensive play to keep the no hitter intact. Right. For baseball fans. It's like edge of your seat. It, it's edge of your seat. So the, and it, so fast forward because uh loved the A's. Paul, Brian, you were A's fans. Unfortunately, we have the misfortune of having the worst ownership in sports. You're not going to, we won't belabor this, but we have the absolute terrible owner who is ripping the heart out of the city and moving the team. And, uh, and this is where I kind of want to get to, to our startup today. And, and Paul and Brian, what you are just the remarkable thing that you're pulling off, because I think I saw this and obviously my heart is ripped out. Um, you know, I think Steve, even as a, as a Giants fan, you love that battle of the Bay, you know, th- your heart is ripped they, out. The A's are the uh, Giants fans, American league team. The, right. And, um, you, you know, I think Adam, obviously you've been like, like everyone feel every baseball fan sees that this is terrible. And it just felt very awful. And it felt like there was no positivity to be had. And Paul and Brian is, you guys found some positivity. So Paul, I'd love to, like, wh- where is the genesis for this outlandish startup idea that you had? Because uh, you're A's fans, right? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're A's fans. Uh, you know, uh, as mentioned, like the rare thing you can do in the Bay, which is, you know, you can have your a- AL team be the, be the A's and then have your NLT be the Giants. And certainly uh, that's true for for, for Brian. Uh, um, uh, you know, so we like, you know, like both teams, we're, we're de- desperately, you know, de- big A's fans. You know, we, our friendship was actually formed uh, being, being A's fans and memories like you and Adam were sharing uh, uh, just how great it is uh, and how much of a bonding experience, you know, kind of baseball can be. Um, we were around, which, is true, which is true. I had, I had a McGuire Conseco poster in, uh, in the late eighties. And I also had a willpower, a will the thrill. You guys mentioned yes. Will Clark before. I would, I, 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 yeah, both ways. All straight A's. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I had the but, I had the A's pennant up. I had the Raleigh Fingers autographed ball. Like, I had a bunch of Oakland stuff. You never told me this. Yeah. I know, I know. Well, it's coming out now. All right, it's coming out. Yeah, sorry, Paul. Yeah, uh, so so my but my background is definitely not you know baseball. My career ended when they took the ball off the tee. Uh, my, but my career has been startups, <laughs> mostly uh, you know uh, ed tech startups specifically. Um, uh, but when uh, the when the whole A's drama was happening, I was you know desperately concerned about what that would mean for Oakland and what that would mean for our community. And you know, there's just a role that baseball plays. I think in in a lot of cities, but but particularly oh. in Oakland, where you know baseball is this thing that brings us together, right? Like the city colors are green and gold. Like there is something about the right field and the left field at the Coliseum that is un- uniquely unifying. And there's something that sports does, which is bring you know people together, and and specifically baseball because there's so much time and space and ability to talk and ability to nerd out and all the things you're talking about. And while that was happening, I was like, you know, I don't know how to. Um, I don't know anything really about baseball, but I know how to start companies that solve problems. And this feels like a problem and maybe a company we're solving. So then I called my close friend, Brian, uh, and Brian and I have been friends since high school, uh, you know, bonded in part by baseball experiences. And over the last few years, we've been looking for something to do together. Uh, Brian's career, and I'll let him talk at some point if his microphone's working, but Brian, Brian's, uh, you know, career has been spent in, 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 in media and, and uh, movies and sort of very different world. Um, but, but, you know, sort of, like I called him and said, "Hey, 
I think there's, you know, business opportunity here. The A's are leaving one of the most entrenched, you know, fan bases. There's 58 years of baseball history. There's multiple organizations whose identities are set around baseball. Like if we can do it the right way, you know, we can build something, you know, interesting. And he's and Brian said, you know, I don't know much, as much about base, as business as you do, but I know about stories. And this is a really interesting story. Uh, and so that was, you know, late June, and we launched, you know, the Oakland Bees, the Ballers, June. and it's very much, wow. you know. Uh, uh, you know, very much a business and, and, and very much a story as all good businesses are. Yeah. Okay. So I was going to ask you what the, what the time frame was. So the original announcement was in April, very gutting. Um, by the time we get through to June, it's kind of pretty clear, like, all right, you know, screw these guys that are leaving. So, and everyone was kind of kicking rocks, honestly, I felt like it, uh, in, um, and I just think it's a remarkable, Paul, that you kind of had that. Brian, what was it like to kind of receive that call and be like, wait a minute, could we, can we actually do this? Can we start a baseball team? I mean, it seems crazy. Yeah, I mean, it was well timed. First of all, like Paul said, we we've been looking for something to do together. I'm also, you know, uh, I'm in the WGA. It was like May, June. I went on strike, so my industry oh, shut down. Yeah. And um, and you know, uh, so I'm sitting there look looking at the rest of my life and watching Hollywood crumble, and also you know, chomping at the bit to do something. Um, d- different and that that uses everything that I love to do with telling stories, but is there a new outlet for it? And we were just devastated, like Paul said, you know, we were just crushed, not just by the fact that the A's were leaving, but the narrative around it, because oh my God, it, it turned so on, bad. right, like sports radio, and oh. also all, like, you know, all, all media, like, you turn on the news and it's like, Oakland is falling apart. This is a city yeah. in decay. Ugh. They've lost the Raiders. They lost the, you know, twice. They lost the Warriors. And now the A's, this is not a pro sports city. And that just did not sit right for us because that is yeah. not our experience with Oakland. Oakland is a beautiful city. Oakland is a city with a really bright future. And it just didn't sit right what was being said. So when Paul called and was like, do you think we could start a baseball team? I was like, well... I mean, we don't know anything about that, but we're like kind of smart and good at doing things. And it's definitely a good story. And I think there's definitely an opening. And we were watching this amazing fan activation around the reverse boycott in June. And, you know, you've got a fan base that people are talking shit about saying they just can't support the team. But we were seeing something that was incredibly contrary to that. We were seeing incredible activation and activism around Let's show this ownership group what we're really all about. And so we're like, you know, if, if, if we if we can do it right and if we can present something that really feels like it's with the community and for the community, you know, maybe people will, uh, maybe it'll work. That's amazing. Okay, so I was going to ask that if the reverse boycott played any role in terms of like, wow, there's a lot. Could you describe the reverse boycott a little bit, Brian? Cause that, I mean, it is one of the most extraordinary experiences of my life. Honestly, I was there with my whole family and, uh, it was, I uh, except my 19 year old who lived out of state and was very jealous that he could, that he couldn't be there for it was there in spirit, but it was such an extraordinary experience for us. So could you describe a little bit the reverse, uh, what the reverse boycott was? Yeah. I mean, Paul, you, I, I devastatingly wasn't there. So Paul, you describe it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so just as context, you know, there is this narrative around, you know, the A's leaving, which is that, you know, Oakland's not a baseball fan. There are no fans here. Um, and Oakland has, you know, been at the bottom of the league for the last few years in attendance. And so there, but, you know, A's fans will tell you that's because there's been no investment on the product on the field. And if you're not going to invest in the product, uh, you know, you're not going to get customers. That's pretty much true in any business. Um, uh, but, you know, kind of to prove the, this notion that there's no fans here wrong, the fans themselves organized the concept of a reverse boycott. So they picked a random Tuesday, deliberately chosen for being particularly random, deliberately chosen for being a Tuesday because that's the lowest attendance uh, 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 days. Um, and uh, Not a Red Sox game, to, importantly, right? A not a Red Sox game. game, <laughs> game. Not, not any place that anybody would care enough that you're going to have to take your hat off before you go in, inside the, the, the house, right? Like this is <laughs> you know, a, a game of... A game, of, a game of very little interest. Um, and the, the idea was like, look, if we can have people show up, all come and show up on this particular day, you know, it shows that the fans are here. It's not the problem. The problem is not with the fans. And they did. It was, you know, uh, I think that they, it was announced, you know, 27,000 people. I think they're now, now yeah. know that there was more than that in the you know, kind of uh, decreased the announcement. And everybody showed up. The energy was like a playoff game or a, or a World Series game. It was incredible energy. And then, you know, most magically, you know, in the fifth inning, 
they oh, did a moment of silence uh, for 55 seconds because the A's had been in, in, in Oakland for 55 seconds. And, at and then Paul, it should be said that silence, it should be said that at that moment of silence, the only thing that we knew we were going to do is be silent. There was no other like further instructions. There was no like what happens after the silence. Like, I don't know. We're just going to be silent for 55 seconds. I, I remember really being like, OK, we're going to be silent. It's amazing. And the whole stadium is silent, you know, 30,000 people silent. And then after that, everybody starts, you know, chanting, chanting, sell the team, sell the team so loud that the announcers on television, you know, couldn't couldn't ignore it uh, that, you know, what was happening. Uh, and the activism of that, the energy of that, the coordination Crazy. of that was incredibly, incredibly impressive, incredibly impressive. So, yeah, that was a like there's something here. There's some energy to to help uh, galvanize or some energy to 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 use and also you know on the flip side like hey if, what's that energy going to do if it doesn't have a channel right and so yeah very much like our idea was like inspired or made believable or whatever you want to say by the reverse boycott that's amazing to hear because the, they also the energy of that game was so positive which it was it was such a great experience and it reminded me god i miss this so much i was there in right field with with my wife and daughter my 16 year old was there with all of his 16 year old buddies they were they all got seats they wanted to be in on the first base lines so they were on the other side and they it, you know it, it was just so great to be among among my among ace fans that were all like you know were across all of these different strata and, you know, people from very different walks of life all coming together for kind of this moment. And it didn't, you know, it, 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 did, it wasn't, didn't feel angry or resentful. It felt uplifting and joyous. And it, it, so it was, it, and you come out of that being like, is this it for, for baseball? And if Paul, it's so funny, you come out of that being like, this can't be it. Like, we got to go, we can go do something with this. Um, can't be it. Okay, exactly. so you, that was the I feel like it can, this can't sort of this can't be it, and we got to do something about it. And yeah, the positivity was incredible. Like people were saying, there's going to be riots or there need to be a police presence. There was none of that. There was absolutely none of that. This was a you know a remarkable peaceful protest and a demonstration of what you know Oakland and the Oakland fan base is all about. And it did feel like I mean it's it, it certainly it, it felt like you're part of not you're not at a sports event. You're part of a social movement of like it, this is a, a city saying like that we exist. You know we're here. And don't count us out. And I again, it was incredibly uplifting. Um, and then, of course, bittersweet as we took tons of selfies as we're leaving the Coliseum because I'm like, I, this could be the last time I'm here. This th th this place that has meant so much for my kids. My kids grew up here. I, I, you know, we were season ticket holders until they doubled the prices and gutted the team. So the all right. So into that, so you call Brian. You're like, we got to go start a baseball team, which is just nuts to me. And I'm so grateful for your insanity in this regard. Um, and like, what's next? I mean, I, I got, I mean, as, as entrepreneurs ourselves and, you know, Adam, you've done this as well. I mean, the, the kind of the first question is like, all right, we got to go like raise money. We got to figure out, I mean, we, what was next? What, what was the kind of the, the, the next step once you decided like, all right, we're in, we don't know anything about this, but we're in. The well, first thing is you do it. You have to, you have to, you have to join a league. Um, uh, and, and, and Brian, maybe you can, you can talk about the, you know, you can't just play baseball against yourself. So unlike yeah. other businesses. You know, you got you got to join a league. Yeah, so we had to join a league, and you know, you, can, you there's affiliate baseball, and there's independent baseball, and in, and there's also collegiate baseball, right? So those those are the those are sort of the levels. Affiliate baseball is tricky. Like, I don't think Oakland wants to be, you know, the Devil Rays or or, or Houston's like affiliate. Like Oakland doesn't. Right. Yeah, that's yeah, just yeah. not going to work for Oakland. So that was not that was not in the cards, and that's also a much that's like a nefarious complicated we got to deal with nlb type of thing and okay. then yep. and then there's so there's collegiate ball and there's independent baseball there's essentially four you know legit indie baseball leagues in america the atlantic league the frontier league the pioneer league and the american association so we you know figured out how to get an agent uh Paul Paul had a connection. Paul had been doing a little bit of investing in some um, in some international uh, sports organizations, and mm. so had an agent. And so we he Paul Paul sets up a meeting for us with this agent who connects you know people that want to want to invest in sports franchises with opportunities and leagues. And he's like, Paul just or Paul said, Brian, two two minutes before the call, just like pretend like you're the big money guy. <laughs> I was like, okay, okay, what does that mean? Uh, Brian, but you're from we, Dubai was, now. You're from Dubai. So just. Yeah, just you're from Dubai. Mind. 
there, there was a little bit of like fake it till you make it. We get, we, you know, we talked to this agent. We subsequently talked to a couple of these independent leagues and they're like taking us seriously. And we would get off the phone or get off the Zooms and we would be like giggling that like, oh, oh my, my gosh, gosh, they, they think that like we're, they're talking to us about, you know, starting an expansion, uh, starting an expansion team. But they were like considering what we were saying about bringing a team to Oakland and they were, Interesting. you know, yeah. yeah. And so, um, so, so because really they, they had seen the same things that you had seen. I mean, because you're kind of coming in. I mean, the, the great thing about that reverse boycott is it really did change the media narrative. People are realizing like, oh my God, there are fans there. And I feel like the number one question you always have with any investors is like, tell me about the market. And I feel like you can say like, yeah, let me tell you about the market because this is a market that exists and it's being abandoned. I mean, it feels like you could, it, was that helping at all? The fact that this was in Oakland, the fact that the reverse boycott had happened? <laughs> They they knew about the market. Yeah, we didn't have to sell them on the on the market. Like people were excited about the market. Uh, um, you, uh, and and the and the concept. You know, we had to uh, eventually sell them on our credibility and capability of actually like pulling this off. Uh, and then we had to solve a lot of like uh logistical hurdles. Uh, oh. like how do you play in a league? Uh, from a, as California teams when the rest of the teams are in Montana, Colorado, and Utah, and um, where do you play? Uh, yeah. face, where do you play baseball right. in Oakland? Yeah, <laughs> um, but but, but you know the that was a big one. But 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 er, but pretty quickly, like multiple leagues were interested in having us, and so then we had the opportunity to decide which one to to participate oh, that's in. Great. We, oh yeah. Wow. Okay. And, and so we, it was know, we had, because of that media narrative that they that they were jumping at it. Um, because of the, the media, the, I think the, because of the media narrative, I think be, they I think folks were interested in uh, Brian and. My background is very different than the people who own minor league teams. They like the idea yeah. of having you know somebody with startup experience, somebody with kind of media experience. Like it was, we we presented a um, you know different as, as much as we were like faking it to make it. Uh, the reality was they actually liked us <laughs> and liked the combination of what what we could probably uh, 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 probably accomplish. Um, so uh, so, uh, so we ended up with multiple offers uh, uh, to join leagues. We ultimately decided on the Pioneer League because we really liked. It's positioning as a league. It's sort of become like the innovation league for baseball. Interesting. Um, so yeah. it so it's it, it it has a relationship with MLB, but it's not the teams are not affiliated. So uh um uh but it does rules innovation. It, it tests new rules and new opportunities for and then the MLB uses the data to make a determination of what rules they want to end up doing in the in the in the future. Uh, and that allows some opportunity to make the game a little bit more fun as well. So like as a as a prime example, instead of extra innings and regular season games, it has a home run derby or a knock. It calls a knockout round, uh, but it's like a home run derby that decides ties. That's pretty um, great. It's I be, like that. Isn't that, that I, like I know. That it's pretty yeah. cool. It's pretty cool. You know, four minutes, you know, four minutes, it's, it's done. It require it, it's, it, it really fan friendly. It also makes the business model easier because you know when things are going to stop. <laughs> you know, oh, interesting. you know I, I never thought about the business model implications of extra innings. There is, it's but there terrible. is obviously, yeah, right. Oh, yeah, when you're in the 18th, yeah. hey, you don't know know when you need your shuttles to go away. Like it's actually having. You already stopped selling anger. beer in the seventh, and then you can't be like, never mind. I know it's the eleventh. We're gonna start selling beer again. <laughs> okay, I just like to. Get, I would like to get my extra innings mixed feelings out there. Uh, it also takes away Jerry Blevins' hit in the 18th inning of a 22 inning game against the Angels at like midnight. Oh. That is one of my best memories as an A's fan. And then Adam, it also takes away the Paw Sox and their 33 inning games. That the, 33. <laughs> That's right. I assume you. I, I I can rely on Connecticut to represent the Paw Sox, right? I mean, is that is that a oh, fair? Oh, absolutely. I mean, well, Red Sox you know, I spent a lot of time in Rhode Island too, so and went to a lot of Paw Sox games. And in fact, you went to a of, Paw Sox game together. That's right. That's right. Right before my wedding, with your kids right. and mine, and uh, and have a lot of cups that that celebrate the thirty three innings. And I don't know if you know that. I got to get this in. My neighbor in Rhode Island <laughs> was the scorekeeper for that game. Do I know uh, this? He, you, this is how yeah. you introduce this person. I took a photo with my kids with this guy being like, this guy is really famous. And it was only after the fact, they're like, wait a minute, what was he? I'm like, he was the scorekeeper for the longest yeah. baseball game. And actually we did go to the hall of fame and that scorecard is in the hall of fame. So this is pretty oh, yeah. great. But okay. Yeah. So we, we have said our piece for extra innings. We have now everything yeah. we've got, everything positive. We have to say about extra innings. From a business perspective, I can see why a home run derby would be a lot more interesting. things that have ever happened in extra innings and you just named them in the history of extra innings. You, you <laughs> named both of them. Uh, um, yeah, uh, it, 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 they also, for example, next year, we're going to, uh, test a challenge rule for challenging, uh, balls and strikes. Um, so, so it's anyway, like we yeah, like, yeah. 
you know, we, we, we kind of like that positioning and think that there's an opportunity. We think baseball could be a little bit more fun. We think the game could be a little bit more engaging. We think it could be a little bit exci- more exciting. And we thought that that fit really well with the product that we were trying to build. And so we ended up choosing, you know, this, this, this Pioneer League. So I got to tell you, I love also, so the Pioneer League, as you mentioned, it's in Idaho, it's in Montana, it's in Utah, it's in Colorado. Um, I, I kind of love where it is. I mean, I grew up in the American West, obviously I grew up in Denver. Um, and my, my 16 year old, 16 year old and I are going to take a road trip this summer to visit colleges and we're going to, we're stopping at some Pioneer League games along the way. So I'm excited to take into, to watch, I think this is the Boise Raptors. I can remember the name of the, the Boise team, but we're going to watch the Boise team. But, um, so the, the now, at what point? So you go to the Pioneer. You're, you're excited about the Pioneer League. They're an innovative league. Um, they also have got caps about how long you can have played in. Like, I, I think you uh, are you allowed any players that have played in Major League Baseball. I mean, this is not like a, a place where players go to retire. This is a right. A, 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 you so leave for young players. You could, so there's like a marketing exception. Like, if we wanted, like, you know, Dennis Eckersley to come and 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 uh, get some saves for us, we could we could do that. There's, I think you have one marketing exception a month, but yes, by and large, it is, um, you have to have three years or fewer of professional, uh, baseball experience. And, you know, at first we were like, what are you talking about? We want to, like, we want to get those old, like retired players when they're coming back. No, no, no. Yeah. But no. it, yeah. but we've really come around after talking to a lot of the other, you know, folks who run the other teams in the league and the, you know, and the front office, uh, the league office because it what it does is it really keeps the caliber of players incredibly high like these are you know MLB had 60 rounds of draft until recently and they constrict they constricted it now to 20 rounds and that means that there is a lot of really really high caliber talent that isn't getting drafted to an affiliate team and this is a league that like you know you know Pedro Martinez came through this league and you know Cody Bellinger and uh the guy who I hate on the Dodgers what's his name uh, Clayton Kershaw. Adam's like, you're going to have to be a lot more. Oh, yeah. You're going to yeah. be a lot more. <laughs> Dodgers, exactly. <laughs> Clay, Clayton Kershaw. And then like, you know, you know, Cal Ripken, George Brett, people like that. So it's a legit league. Incredible talent comes through there. And, um, and it, I think that keeping it to these players in their first three years of pro experience helps it stay at that high level. So I have to say, I love this. I, I, I love this aspect of it. Um, you know, my, my oldest plays college ball. So, you know, you see those guys who are all like working so hard and it's such a, it's an infectious energy and it, everyone is, is, you know, they're all pursuing their dream. Like they've all got their own story of the dream that they are pursuing and they haven't made it. And I think it's, it's so much fun to watch. I think it gives us such a positive energy. Uh, and, and I think it also just because they're, they are, um, it, they are kind of on the upswing. You get some of these, I think the best memories. I mean, I, I, Brian, I don't know that, you know, during that kind of 2012, 13, 14 run for the A's, uh, I remember going to watch a bunch of Stockton ports games and realizing like, man, there are some good guys in the system. This whole, like this Matt Chapman guy and Matt Olson guy, these guys rake and watching those guys hit at, uh, and of course like the full, you know, they were at the ports. It was great to watch them at the Stockton ports. They played at the A's. I love them. The A's. And then of course they got, you know, traded away for absolutely nothing. Um, and are now going to Matt Chapman now at the giants and, and Matt Olson with the Braves. But the, um, I, I love that aspect of it. And I, when the river cats were the A's minor league affiliate, I went to go watch, was watching river cats games with my kids. And cause they just couldn't get enough of it. It was great. And we saw this guy at the River Cats, and I love learning his story. And this guy had been up to the show briefly, had never gotten a hit, was back down to the River Cats, and the guy is just raking. He's a catcher. And the, we had three catchers up at the A's. I'm like, I'm never going to see this guy play at the A's, but I love him. I love watching him play. And uh, it's just kind of a shame because like, there's never going to be room for him. And it turns out, a couple injuries later, there was room for him. That was Stephen Vogt. And, you know, we were there when he got his, we got his first hit as a, he, he hadn't gotten a hit at all as nice. a race player. And it's like, oh my God, that story, watching that guy get his first hit. And it just felt like, you know, when my son got his autograph, it's so like that, that stuff is so meaningful to watch these guys who haven't made it yet on the upswing is just really exciting. I think the stories are great. So I, yeah, I, I love the fact. I mean, that's a, you know, it's a good, it's for, it tells everything is, you know, first of all, the, the, the talent at this level is really strong and the difference between people who make it or not are knife's edge. So, you know, 
Yes. Uh, could be injuries in front of you, whether you make it or not. Um, you know, talent is really strong. And the accessibility of baseball players at this level is like much different than than at an MLB game. I mean, these are players who are excited about giving autographs for the first time. They're excited about playing in front of fans, you know, big, big groups of fans for the first time. It's just a much more accessible uh, experience. Uh, and there's just a lot of energy. So yeah, as Brian said, like we initially were concerned about that, uh, are now really excited about, you know, the, 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 where this sits and the fact that it's a developmental league. Uh, totally. All right. So now at what point, so you're excited about, about being in, in the, in the pioneer league and was it contingent upon you entering or at what point is it revealed to you that, Hey, by the way, we can't just add one team to the league. <laughs> was, did you kind of know that going in? No, we didn't. No. Uh, it, you know, it's just so dumb. It's just so dumb because, you know, it's how hard it is to start anything, you know, uh, and you, and it's like, you want to start two of the things at the same time. It's like 18 times harder. I don't know how that math works out, but that's exactly the the ratio. Um, it, it, the, it, you know, so we, it, we were looking for other options. We, we only, we only wanted to do one team, uh, but you need even number of teams in leagues for scheduling sake. Right. Uh, um, and so, uh, there were some options of other owners who were thinking about joining the, the, the pioneer league and the, the, uh, commissioner, uh, and president were looking to see if we they can push them to join a little earlier than they were expecting. And one by one, they just, it, they didn't work out. And so it was, getting you know sort of late in the cycle and it was like we we either have to wait uh until 2025 or we have to launch two teams uh and we just didn't feel like we could wait you know we just didn't know how bizarre or un, or, or like toxic or just you know bad that this year was going to be in oakland yeah. without there being you know something that was guiding hope something that was saying that baseball was going to stay we just didn't want to do that and so we kind of bit the bullet and said let's launched two teams and so then that became the the yolo high wheelers which is the other california team launched in the pioneer league in 2024 and and steven adam i'm sure if you know this that they started the yolo high wheelers as well that they started the the yolo county team um no i knew they I were mean, playing uh, the yellow hat yeah no they started the team they started the yellow that's our team too. <laughs> yeah that's that they, they they're like all right i guess we have to like Okay, oh. like like so, this VC needs to start a second company. I guess we'll start a second <laughs> company as well. But are we just, competing? Literally competing in the funding. same space. Yeah. Start, yeah. yeah, start a we'll competing. Start product. your own competitor. Well, then they also. I have to say, the thing I also love is they also like. All right, well, screw it. We're also going to start a rivalry. So they have started like a Giants Dodgers rivalry between the Ballers and the Yellow <laughs> High Wheelers. I, I'm a little worried that like you know the. 80 years from now, kids are going to be like, yeah, there's a dividing line in this home between the Yolo. You can come in with a Yolo High Wheelers hat, but you have to take it off before you enter this home. This is an Oakland Bowers home. You'd be like, you know, actually the owner, the, originally those were the startup, those were the same. Yeah, same this is how Michigan and Ohio State started, started too. <laughs> is that right? Yeah, that's great. Um, but I think it, it was, I also, I mean, that is just, this is where the story to me just gets like, fractal in terms of the challenge like you got so much challenge to get a place to play and everything else and you're like okay i need to do this in parallel in an organization in an organization All the people that you need yeah. to run it i mean it incredible that you had to go to two of these and w w how like how close to waiting to 2025 were you or was that well, never a consideration I, I we didn't feel it, like it we wasn't could. Like yeah okay, go ahead probably yeah, it it just wasn't a it was it wasn't a consideration. It just didn't work for the problem we were going to solve. It was like it was almost like if we it was like don't do this at all or yeah. two teams. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was closer to that consideration rather than thinking that we could wait until twenty twenty five. It was you know the 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 need to kind of say there's going to be a next chapter in, in baseball in baseball in Oakland, the need to have some sort of like thing that to say yes to, as opposed to say no to. I mean, we were very worried that the, what well, the positivity, the reverse boycott was going to hit the, the reality of you no, know, the A's are, are definitely going and that that was going to break apart this like energy in this community. And we just didn't want it to let it happen. So no, I mean, it was, we, we, we might've said that this, it, we can't do this. Uh, but, but if we had to do it, you know, we were going to accept the additional, uh, complexity of the, you've, that you've all gone through. Cost, <laughs> complexity, about, you know, oh, oh, it's everything. It, it, well, and it's amazing. And I mean, I personally like can't wait to go it, it to, I mean, so you picked a part of that is also deprived of baseball, Yolo County. So this is in Davis, California, just outside of Sacramento. And here, very, very, <clears throat> very familiar with it because I was stuck on the Yolo causeway for <laughs> right. about two hours back from Tahoe. Um, 
And so th- this, this is a, another, I mean, you've picked another good spot. I love, can you describe the high wheelers as a name? Cause I think people are like, wait, what's the high wheelers about? I love what you've done with the branding there. Can you describe that a little bit? Sure. High wheeler is a historic type of, ba- uh, of, of bicycle with a very large wheel in the front and a very small wheel in the back, you know, like those like old timey right. bicycles. And, uh, uh, they're very hard to ride. We the 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 man the uh, uh, the bicycle hall of fame is actually in Davis. Davis is like one of the greatest biking. If you guys have spent, if anybody spent time there, it's one of the greatest biking communities you know in the country. Incredibly bike friendly. Incredibly proud of their bike culture. Not a lot of people riding these old timey high wheelers, but it is the <laughs> town like it's the town logo. Like if you go to the city of Davis, yeah. they've got a high wheel bike, and we were like, that's cool. Would that the people you know, let's do that. And uh, that's how it happened. We, of that course, we awesome. did like a big brand exploration and had, you know, invest, spent the month investigating other names and then went back to the first thing that we thought of. No, no, right. It didn't always works that way. It's like, all right, let's do the in-depth research. Actually, as it turns out, the thing that we had with our gut and that was actually the right thing all along. Exactly. I, I love that. I also love, so this begins to tack into a couple of other things that I think you guys have just nailed. And and this, certainly we've tried to do the same at Oxide, very different problems, starting a computer company. But it was similar in that we, we knew that people would want this. We'd have the kind of the, the wind at the back and the kind of the reverence for history is something that's been really important for us. And I love your reference for all history, baseball history and otherwise. And you get it in I mean, it feels like that's a very deliberate way to to kind of to to engage these communities and to lift them up. I mean, is that a, is that a fair read? A hundred percent. You know, our you know whole I, I concept is that like baseball existed in uh, Oakland bef- before the A's. Baseball is going to exist in Oakland after the A's. And part of being, we want to be part of that next chapter. We've said that you know from the launch. That's our that's our goal is to to like continue this you know wonderful culture uh, that exists around around baseball. Uh, but if you want to be part of the future, you have to recognize and acknowledge and appreciate the past. And there's such amazing past in in Oakland. And we've done a series of of limited edition hats where we are kind of one by one acknowledging um, teams like the Oakland Oaks, the Oakland Larks, uh, and and recognizing you know them and honoring their colors and um, you know we're going to do a lot more of that when it comes to game time you know uh, programming. Uh, what the place that we end up playing, what we're going to end up playing baseball, Ramonde Park was. Um, Oakland Tribune once said more MLB players got their start from this municipal park than any other park uh, in the country. And we wanted to play at Ramonda because of that history, because that's where Kurt Flood played. That's where Frank Robinson played. Uh, that's where, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like we are very much wanting to acknowledge, lift up, embrace the history of 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 Oakland baseball. Uh, and we sh- should ha- we have to do that if we want to be part of the future. It's Steve, I got to ask you, you grew up in grew up in the East Bay. You that your your parents have a business in West Oakland. You've been in West Oakland. You worked at West Oakland as a kid. Yeah, Did you know all, all this job. about all this incredible history about Raymondy Park. I, I didn't at all, and I started. I asked my dad about it. So the the Atlas Heating Heating and Air Conditioning Company on Thirty Second and Peralta, just you know, hand, handful of blocks north of Raymondy Field, um, was asking about that, and it turned out he actually had done some work with city organizers trying to get that field back to doing something. And this is obviously like, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Um, but he had worked with Ellen Wyrick Parkinson, who was a longtime activist and had had tried to, to make something of the field. And um, they just could never get anything off the ground. Uh, so I also was kind of miffed with him. I'm like, hey, where, 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 where are these stories? <laughs> Why haven't I heard of this before? Yeah, never heard yeah. of any of this. And then, uh, he, so of course he was ecstatic to see Oakland ballers show up and anytime you're getting new economic development investment in West Oakland, it's a pretty tight knit community. And I was going to ask you guys just what that response and kind of uh, has been from the broader community as, as you were thinking about sites and eventually choosing this site. Um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the response from the community uh, in Prescott, which is the neighborhood that Ramadi is in, in, in West Oakland, has been incredibly positive. Um, and we've done a lot of work to engage the community. I literally went with the local council member door by door, like canvassing to see whether this was something that the neighborhood wanted. Right. Oh, um, wow. That's awesome. We've had we've had community meetings, you know, almost every two weeks, you know, 
uh, since we announced our intention to play there, to, to listen to what the community was excited about, to address the concerns of the community. Like it's very important to us that what we build in Ramonde is built with the community, not on the community, and too often kind of development yeah, in general, totally. specifically like, um, specifically, uh, stadiums are built on top of, of communities without sort of engaging the community stakeholders. And we actually want to build a, a stadium the way you build a startup, like from the ground up, piecemeal over time, you know, in, in partnership with your, you know, with your community. Uh, and so far, you know, the, the neighborhood has been tremendously I I excited about it. I and there also just feels it. like there's so much potential. So much that, potential. Oh my community. God. You've yeah. got you know, multi-generational families that have been there. You've got just such amazing pockets in West Oakland that with the right kind of localized business are going to flourish. I mean, you can definitely look at it and see, you know, a couple of years from now, this being uh, just a, a, a key piece of that neighborhood and that kind of broader area coming back to life. And it's exciting. It's really exciting. And we, w w for those folks who are outside of the Bay Area, you should know that Oxide is very, very close to Ramondi Park. We are, uh, so w we're stoked to be within walking distance to Ramondi. Um, and we are very close to where, where the Oaks used to play, though. That, that's now a Pixar campus. So we're just kind of across the street from Pixar here. Um, but I, 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 it was so great when you guys announced that location and explained the history of it, which I definitely didn't know. And it's like, wow, there's all this, I knew the history of the Oaks, but, but not of the Larks, for example, I thought that was great too. Um, and so you, you, you kind of mentioned the merch in passing. Um, I'd like the record to reflect that I am wearing, You're wearing some good merch right now. Well, what am I wearing right now, Steve? You're wearing a baller's hat, I, the, the green and white. I right now I'm on the merch site, looking at the new black and gold. Which is you, you better, so you better go quickly because there's only two. I know, I know, I know. I'm trying to that. check out while we're on here. <laughs> so yeah. this hat, by the way, that and I was listening to a uh, to a podcast uh, with another the, uh, with your the Bowers GM explaining that like I got players whose families want a hat, and I'm like, yeah, I can't get it any like we are backlogged on all merch. We sold out apparently. How fast? How fast did this hat sell out? I mean, it sold out uh, very quickly, right? Yeah, I mean, all, so all of the drops have 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 sold sold out incredibly quickly and sort of exceeded our expectation. The first we were told by our friends at Oaklandish, Oaklandish for those outside the Bay Area is a is a you know Oakland based lifestyle brand, you know, very strong, very rep, you know represents Oakland, uh, you know works with all of the big you know brands. We were told that our first half hat drop was the most successful hat drop they had had with the exception of a limited edition of warriors drop uh but it was the second in their, in their time crazy. history and it far exceeded their expectations uh then we restocked that this is just our 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 forest and green and ran out of the restock right before christmas uh and then you know we were doing these new era limited edition hats and we had no idea what to expect i mean they're new era hats they're not they're they're, they're, they're you know newer hats aren't aren't cheap uh, we're doing them in colors that aren't our own colors. We're a brand new team. And, you know, so far, every drop that we've done has sold out within five days of, of and, you know, this one, the 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 Oaks, uh, um, the Larks one that we, we dropped last week will almost certainly, you know, sell out today, if not tomorrow. Uh, and, you know, the response has been incredibly overwhelming. It's also really, ex you know, one of the things that we intend to do around this is like, normally you, as a new company, you would say, hey, just keep your brand consistent. Don't mess with new colors. Uh, or, but it's going to be so Oakland at our home games that everybody has the same hat, but everybody's going to be having the same hat in slightly different colors. Uh, and, but they're, you know, we're all there together. We're all repping the same team. I, I love it. And I gotta say, I mean, they look great too, is the other thing. I mean, it's like, you know, my 16 year old is, I, you know, when he, when he saw that, he's like, dad, have you seen the devour side? I'm like, yeah, I've seen the devour side. He's like, it is, it is straight fire. And they, 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 you know, the 16 year olds love it. And I think you've, uh, they've got the 16 year olds as a group. I think I actually have pretty good taste in this kind of stuff. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust them for much, but, um, I mean the, the, I don't know, are, are you partnering with Oaklandish to design the hats? I mean, what's the, who are you engage, engaging with in terms of, of the actual, like the creative side of that? Because it, it is, they're good looking. So our, our designer is Dustin Cannellan. He is amazing. He, you know, he designed the town, like the iconic Warriors town oh, Jersey. Wow. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. So, yeah. So a buddy of mine connected us to Dustin like early on in, I think early July, well before we were established when a lot of people were still kind of like, what are you guys doing? What really? <laughs> that's like going to be your job now. Uh, and <laughs> Dustin, you know, Grew up in Alameda, lives in New York now, but like loves the Bay Area. He has his own line with Oaklandish and has been close with them for a long time. And he, you know, he, I, we just think he hit the branding out of the park. So he, he, he did our entire visual identity and helped us, uh, 
helped us, uh, you know, for, you know, further, further fortify our relationship with, uh, with Oaklandish who are now, you know, are essentially our apparel partners. So, yeah, I, I love it. And I love how, I mean, cause it feels so, it feels fresh, but also, uh, obviously reverential and referential and it just, it's, it is really, really terrific. It's been, and also it must be, it must be exciting for you all to see that just that quick uptake and to see how, excited people are. I mean, I gotta tell you, like, you know, I gave my daughter a baller's shirt for Christmas and I mean, she, it was her favorite present. By far. She was just delighted um, because I think she is so excited about it. And I just think it's like, man, that is, it is so great. You know, I mean, to be able to deliver that kind of joy. I mean, this is the power that, that you've got and to be able to do that with new company formation is just unbelievably terrific. Yeah. I mean, it's fun when you're right. It's fun when you see somebody rocking a baller's hat on BART. That for me, that's like, that it's like, cause I, you know, you see your friends wearing them and the people that have been bugging you to get hats for the last couple of months. And that's one thing that's not that fun. But when you see like a stranger on BART wearing a hat for a team that we thought of six months ago and we're like, is this going to work? And now people are wearing literally new era fitted hats on BART that that's that I do appreciate. That makes it kind that of is all awesome. Right, so you, see, you mentioned BART. You also have got BART as a, as a sponsor, right? You got BART on the Jersey, which I think is terrific. Yeah. Yeah. And which, which, you know, both of those sponsors, BART, BART and AAA are, you know, marquee sponsors, not normally the sponsors that, you, that a pioneer league uh, team would, would, would get, uh, and you know, the, our, when we did the sponsorship, we were invited to the number one morning show on, on the Bay area to announce this, the, the, the sponsorship. And then, you know, that you know, led our kind of, we ran through our stock of pre-drop jerseys. Well, you know, uh, sort of immediately like that, the initial returns on the initial evidence of excitement is, is really there. Um, and it's, it's humbling and it's, you know, it's, it's really great. I mean, as anybody who's built an organization knows, there's like a lot of tough days, right? Like it is still a startup. It's actually two startups. And if you can imagine how much like, you know, uh, grind and complexity and talent is, uh, it's, you know, it, it is, it's, you, that's all this that you're operating in. But it is nice to see the excitement. Um, it's very different than any other startup I've done bef before. Like multiple people <laughs> have thanked me on the street for starting this team, like thanking me for, you know, uh, telling me stories about how important baseball was to them, how devastated they were thinking about the A's and and how the one bright spot was, you know, the, the Oakland ballers. And, you know, that makes it, uh, m makes the grind feel a lot better. Makes the grind feel a lot better. Well, I was just going to ask, because there have been so many days like that for us, Steve, and I'd be where it have been really tough days and where, you know, things are not going and you're like, what are we doing? <laughs> what? And it is, and it's the fact that we, you know, we have had so many out there cheering for us. And I mean, obviously a very different dynamic, but the, you know, the, then you'll, you'll see the oxide shirt on the street, right? Yeah. The, well, I don't mean, metaphorically, <laughs> well, I, in like, I've been stopped, you know, wearing oxide gear. I get stopped by people who talk about how it's like, Oh, I'm never going to be a customer, but I love what you're doing. It's like, well, when you say never going to be a customer. Like, maybe, hold, maybe, on. hold on. <laughs> this is the nice thing. You, you know, Paul and Brian, you could be like, Hey, you know, our, our, our tickets started like 25 bucks. Like you can be a, everyone can be a customer. Whereas like, you know, uh, ours, uh, our machine started a little, a little more than 20, a little more than $20. Um, <laughs> But it's like, I, I just like know exactly what you mean because those days feel like, oh man, this is like, this is meaningful and it's important to me and it's important to other people. And it's like, when you hit those headwinds, that must just, it, I, I mean, it's just easy to remind yourself about how important this is. And in your case, like important at like such a deep resonance. I mean, Community level, a family level. Totally, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I was I was telling <clears throat> Brian before this, I was sending an email out to our uh, OBA Pinto team families about so Rinda baseball league. Yeah. Sorry. Rinda, Rinda baseball. Uh, and these are, you know, six, seven year old kids. And it, it is in some ways kind of the best age because it's, I mean, it is such a, a fun age to see kids starting to like fall in love with baseball and yeah. enjoy the game and starting to understand the rules and like the, 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 the intricacies of baseball and, and also like playing with dirt and throwing in each other's eyes. <laughs> uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's so great to have a good vector to try and get like this team out for kind of a postseason event. 
and uh, and the, the ballers are just such a good vector for that. And you and you could just see that kind of flourishing across all of Oakland, and it's going to be fun. I mean, what's wait. the what's the capacity? Five thousand, right? It's it, it, it's it's for it's for it's just around four thousand. Uh, um, actually, we went through you know a v- various uh, ups and downs as we were laying out what the ballpark can hold. But if, so the first year is going to be around four thousand uh, uh, capacity, and we hope that uh, there's a lot of games where that's you know that's full uh, because four thousand uh, passionate Oakland fans you know rooting for a team that's winning. <laughs> that's going to be it's going to be loud. That's going to be deafening. It's yeah. going to be it is going to be great. Well, so I mean, yeah, and Steve, a couple of so on that you say the seven eight year olds and you know in this whole saga there have been some journalists that have been covering it right closely uh, and uh, Brody Brazil and Casey Pratt um, and uh, Paul and Brian. I'm sure you remember Brody Brazil broke down on air. Um, and when he broke down, it was when, and it's, you know, I, the tears come to my eyes just thinking about it, but when he described that seven to eight year old kid, you know, in Danville or in East Bay and, you know, not able to wear an Oakland A's hat, you know, he just saw it. He's on Oakland A's hat on a seven year old in the, and he just thought to himself, there's not, there's not gonna be anything that replaces that. And I think that like to have something that replaces that for that kid, for those kids that are like, and like even better, like by the way, my hat got signed by all the players because they're all super stoked to have someone. Uh, which actually kind of leads to my next question, uh, Paul. Right? What do the players think? Are the what are the? I mean, they must also be excited to be involved in this. Yeah, they're really excited, and you know, we've 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 started to get to know them a little bit. Um, but I think that's really spring training starts next month, and that's when we'll do. I you know I've gotten to know about three or four players so far pretty well but the rest not so much just a couple emails back and forth but i think they're all from what we've what we've seen so far incredibly humbled by they i think they feel like they're a part of something bigger than themselves and it's not just like your random you know minor league baseball team that they're joining but that there's that there's something kind of historical happening that feels special and so that's that's cool like we we love that like people are excited to come and be a part of this thing and that's the players that's also just it's across the board honestly like it's elected officials in in oakland it's community members and prescott like paul was getting at um so we've never like we don't know what this is going to feel like once it starts once the season starts but so far it has been uh overwhelmingly positive and i think there's just a lot of energy around you know proving this narrative that oakland can't come together and get something done proving that wrong Totally. What I also loved that, you know, you, you, because, you know, and we found the same thing at Oxide, you know, kind of, you become this magnet for people that want to see that same difference in the world. And one of the folks that you attracted was JT Snow as a first base coach. And, and and I know, and Steve, I remember I told you about this. You're like, you're thinking of a different JT Snow. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm like, no, no, same JT Snow. He's like, I don't think you've got, I don't think that that's right. I'm like, all right. And you're like, oh my well, God. Well, we got the email and we were like, who's pretending to be JT Snow and emailing us? I would have the same reaction. He literally, it was Christmas. And he and we get an email to whatever, like info at oaklandballers.com. Hi, this is JT Snow. I used to play, you know, for the San Francisco to- <laughs> Angels. And like, you may know curious me from the opportunities. And we were like, come on. And then, you know, uh, there's always these jump balls with who's going to call the person. And uh, Paul, <laughs> Paul, I, I, I was know. like, I'll do this one, Paul. I got this one before Paul could even like raise his hand and then start and then fa- FaceTime with JT Snow, who's like, I've been watching what you guys are doing. I've been seeing it on the news and I'm just really inspired by what by this thing that you're creating. And it was it, honestly, it was like the Twilight Zone because it's like, but you're you're JT Snow. You saved Dusty Baker's kid. Baker's kid. You know? yeah. yeah, right. Right. In the world and series. also just like one of the most humble baseball yeah. players, a terrific storyteller. Um, incredibly yeah. humble, incredibly humble guy. The, o- the only thing that's a little humble braggy about him um, is that he does have his six gold gloves in his like background on a Zoom he, I noticed that too. I actually Would you that. not? <laughs> no, no. Dude, of course weren't I you? He has six I mean, straight gold I gloves. Will. 
I'd carry would, them around would the on bar like, of my Zoom screen. I would make it, you know, I would talk about it constantly. I'm just saying, like, that's yeah. that's how humble. Oh, he I, is. I, I'm he sorry. Let me move these gold gloves so I can make room for the. I, oh, sorry. The gold gloves in your way. Let me. Sorry. Let me just move that out of the way there. Exactly. It's, I like yeah. it. It's a little intimidating. It, Don Wakamatsu, who runs baseball for us, he also like whenever Paul and I see him in person, he's he's rocking his World Series ring, and he'll like twist <laughs> it around. If we he'll twi he'll twist it around his finger, which is a like a humble reminder to Paul and I that like we're not the people that uh, actually know about the baseball things. That would be Don. But that must be amazing to be able to attract these folks. Or like, okay, these folks like you know Don Watsumazu and, and JT Snobs. Like these are I, they, they, you know we're having to like move over World Series rings and Golden Gloves. Like these are people who really know baseball well, and their enthusiasm must also be really infectious. It, it makes it, yeah, it, 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 early on when Walk, you know, Walk, 35-year, uh, you know, career in baseball, 17 as a player, 18 as a coach, first Asian-American manager in the history of MLB, like two World Series rings in two different organizations, totally legit, respectable he, he guy. When he agreed to, to work for us, it was one of those moments, and, you know, you have them in startups where you're like, oh, we, we've just hired somebody who's way better than us. <laughs> yeah, um, those moments are uh, the and, best. And, oh, my God, those moments the are best. so great. They're the, they're the best. And then, and then, of course, what happens is that, you know, creates a flywheel. And then we get Micah Franklin, yeah. who's like the world's best hitting coach and Aaron Miles and JT Snow, you know, calls us. And like, now we have, you know, what some journalists have said is like a MLB quality coaching staff for a Pioneer League team. And that helps you get better players because these because are developers. Players. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And they, because and you, they yeah. 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 They can choose where they go. And so they, they're choosing to go to here because they know that they're going to get way better development than anywhere else. And then that allows us to put a better product in the field. Well, and this flywheel effect is so important in a startup, especially because it, it is. This is how you begin to gain momentum. Is because you would, you attract these extraordinary people, but then it, it attract extraordinary people, and you just have to. I, I mean, it's, do you remember when Adam joined? I do remember. God, I remember when Adam joined. We we we, we guy actually got this guy. Oh, like who is this? God. Who is this impersonator? Oh, who, who, who's guys. claiming to be Adam Leventhal? <laughs> who is this terrible man that wanted the Red Sox to break up Sean Manaya as no hitter? <laughs> who should make the call? Uh, but no, it, 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 it is exhilarating. Um, and it, it, I mean, that was, that's extraordinary again for the players. Okay. So then I, the other thing I, I definitely want to ask you about, cause I think I absolutely love I me. Mean, you, you guys do so many things that are so clever and engaging and opening. I loved this open tryout that you did. Um, could you describe that a little bit? Cause I thought that was terrific. Yeah. So I mean, we really wanted to get more, uh, players from Oakland uh, and uh, wanted to get as many local players as, as, as possible. Uh, and so we had the idea that, um, you know, there's a lot of great talent out here. MLB has cut its draft significantly. There's a number of players who just haven't, you know, been on the radar, missed out on the opportunity. Let's invite them to come to uh, a tryout and see if we can find, you know, anybody who can, can make the team. We, we had filled the majority of our roster, but we left a few slots for, for players to be able to, to make it. And so then we invited everybody to come out to Laney college about, you know, 10 days ago and, and about 92 people came and we, you know, we ended up making three offers. Well, and I love the fact that you had, you, you had, it was an open tryout. So you had, you know, people that, you know, you had Casey Pratt trying out, you know, you had, uh, and the, the kind of back and forth online was very funny about that, but it was great that you, just to get people engaged. And then of course, like you got some, you got some really interesting folks out of that. Uh, and uh, do you want to describe who you got out of that? Because uh, we're going to be, uh, there's some terrific folks. Sure. I mean, well, you know, the one that's kind of been, been making waves is, uh, is Kelsey Whitmore, uh, who we hire, who, who, who we brought in to pitch for us. Uh, Kelsey is a woman and she uh, is going to be be on the Oakland Ballers this year. She's she played uh, pro ball for the Staten Island Ferry Hawks in uh, last year in the Atlantic League, and uh, she's she's a middle reliever. Uh, actually, I think for the last two years, and you know we had we had met with her. We were kind of interested in her. Walk Walk was looking at her, but we decided we weren't ready to make an offer for her. But we did invite her to come to our open tryout you know, where our coaching staff will be and let's see what she's got. And she just like brought it. She it was, it was incredible. I mean, she doesn't, she doesn't overpower hitters, but her command of the strike zone, she can just sort of place it wherever she wants. And 
the coaching staff just all looked at each other. And by the way, Paul and I don't make baseball decisions. We leave that to the people that know how to make baseball decisions, but they all, you know, they just said, said, yes, let, let's do this. And um, so really excited to have her on the team. Also like my, you know, my 10 year old daughter and her 10 year old friend were at the tryout and they were like, they couldn't believe it. It was, they were so excited to watch Kelsey. So from, I, I do think that like, uh, while we weren't going to, we, while we weren't going to sign her because she is a woman, the fact that we signed her based on her ability, I think that there is like, there is an opportunity to bring in other other people, my daughter notwithstanding, who otherwise might be like this game, whatever. But, you know, they were literally like, you, you could see this light and glow in my daughter's eyes because she was so excited that to, to watch this woman pitch. So really excited about her, Paul. Uh, and then signed two other players that, I, that I'm less familiar with, <laughs> to be honest. Um, uh, one of them throws 95, so you've got some yeah. folks that throw gas. Um, the, uh, the, yeah, they got picked up another pitcher, and then I think a shortstop as well, right? I mean, they've got um, maybe a, what's from, that? From, San, from, from, San, from San Francisco, who is one of the best little leaguers, a uh, little league oh, all-star yeah. in San Francisco, and, and was, high, was, was, was very highly regarded uh, initially in the, in, in the draft and, and think that uh, you know, st- still has a great career in front of him. That is awesome. When I mean, I personally love just like experiment. I mean, I'm really excited to see Kelsey Whitmore pitch because I love it. Just well, looking at the footage and you know hearing about the, what the coaches were saying about about command and placement and and uh, the. I mean, I personally think that we have over enshrined velocity. Just to not to not to go too much down the baseball rat hole, but uh, velocity is important. It also injures a lot of pitchers, and uh, I you know I personally. Think a Greg Maddox would do pretty well in the MLB today, and uh, a real craftsperson who who knows pitch location and everything else. So I'm a, I'm excited for this. Or I couldn't agree more on that front, and not to get nerded out on on baseball specifically, but I think that's right. And then in an era where everybody's you know what what is translatable from baseball to other fields is when everybody's going in one direction. There's sometimes a really strong opportunity to go in the exact opposite direction, and 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 everybody's going oh. for just power. And so it's a very different look now for somebody who's not powerful, but is just hitting every single corner with every single pitch. Uh, it's a big change in, in look. And so, uh, you know, that's part of the logic, uh, um, you know, for, for Kelsey and I, re- and I think actually part of the logic for a whole bunch of opportunities for different styles uh, of, of pitchers is like everybody's been in baseball sort of chasing the same thing, which is let's just try to throw a hundred. Uh, and then when everybody tries to chase the same thing, if you do it differently, you really have a, you're, you're, you have, you have a differentiation. You have another, you have an opportunity. That's yeah, like Oakland baseball. And, and, and at right? the same time, uh, all the other teams in the Pioneer League, they all play at altitude, right? Because they're all, you know, Idaho, Colorado, uh, Utah, Montana. So I think the fact that we're going to be the only teams that play at sea level is good. It's just a different thing. And, you know, these games in the Pioneer League, because the ball travels, it's like the Rockies, right? They're often yeah. like 14 to 18, but it's going to be yeah. different when they come to the Bay. And so I think that, that that could potentially benefit somebody with, with you know, precision pitching around the strike zone like Kelsey tremendously. Well, yeah, and so in particular, just so to, to give people a little bit of color on this, so uh, in baseball, the altitude really makes a difference, and the ball will go a lot further at altitude. As a result, people, it is harder for the, part of the reason that the Rockies have never really broken out, uh, pitchers do not want to go pitch at altitude. And so I think that you've got a real differentiator in terms of being able to get pitchers that are like, yeah, I, I thank you. Thank you. No, I don't feel I need to get lit up at, at um, it's in, in, you know, Utah or whatever. Um, so I, that's going to be a really interesting dynamic. And Adam, I love what you said about in terms of like, it sounds like Oakland baseball. Um, I mean, this is what Oakland has done in, and I, I think that this is the, 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 the terrific tradition that you are carrying on of like being creative. Um, and I gotta say, this is where you get like, this feels, this is so a area to me. And one of the things I loved about going to A's fan, the A's games is it, it was a, it, I'm like, this is the, to me such a true Bay Area experience where people are so creative and brainy and energetic. And to me, what you all have done, this is like, this is a Bay Area solution to this problem um, of just being innovative and being bold and willing to do something that other people just thought was impossible. Um, and But to do it with the community at your back. Um, and 
I'm excited. I gotta tell you, I am super excited. I know that I'm sure like, so, and just to be clear, so folks understand like Raimondi park is being built basically right now. I mean, the park exists, obviously historic park, but you all are doing a lot of improvements, like say building seats right now, right? We, we, we are. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's, it's a park. It's been around for, you know, for, for decades. We talked about, about, uh, about its, its history. Um, but we had to do a lot of work just to get the baseball field up to pro standards because it hadn't been used for five years and the irrigation system wasn't working and the grass was overgrown. And then we are building, it's temporary, it's not, you know, it's, it, but we are building, you know, 4,000 plus, you know, temporary uh, grandstands. So the vibe is going to be like 48 block parties around a baseball field. Um, uh, and, all, you know, a lot of work is being done. You know, right now, most of that work is in the ground. You know, I think sod is coming next week. Um, but it's been really great. And we haven't even done this, but the neighbors have been like, you know, taking videos and putting on on Instagram and putting, you know, putting it on, uh, you know, other places and just excited reporting the progress, you know, just wait until May when the structures start coming up, like it's going to be, we're going to see a ballpark being built in, in, in an Oakland, you know, in a, in a, in a month, really. And you know, you kind of made, made references earlier, but I just because there is this narrative out there, it's like, oh, the city doesn't want you to build everything. It seems like the city has been really excited to help you get this thing built. Beyond. Yeah, they've been, I mean, they've been our partners. They're literally clearing the way for us. Um, so it's, it's, it's the opposite of what, you know, um, what has been said about this. Our experience has been the opposite of what was said about working with the city of Oakland by the team that's leaving. I'll just leave it at that. That is awesome. And I think the, 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 the team that's leaving, the team that, that shall remain unmentioned. Um, <laughs> Voldemort. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, that it, it, and just I think it. Everybody wants to prove the world wrong, the city included, right? I think the city is like, no, we want to show that you can build here. We want to show that fans want to show like we we can support this. West Oakland and Prescott wants to show that like, no, you can build stuff here, and we're excited for it. Um, and uh, that is so. All right, so you describe your schedule. When does that kind of kick off here? Um, because that's uh, the other thing. You know, in a startup you have, you know, you often are trying to do things as quickly as possible, but your schedule is rarely dictated externally the way yours has been. Like you have a very fixed schedule that you're up against. Yeah. 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 So our first home game, you know, game start in May, you know, uh, in May, uh, but we start on the road for the first couple of weeks. Uh, the big date, the one that's like, you know, on our, that will live in infamy, infamy on our calendar uh, because it is unmovable in ways that product releases and other things, you know, tend not, not to be is June 4th. Um, and so we, it is a, you know, all hands on deck, you know, constant daily effort to make sure that all of things that need to happen in order to, you know, build a, a ballpark, um, uh, you know, in, in, in by, by June 4th it is, is, is done. And that's the first home day. Um, you know, we're, we're hoping uh, and expecting that it's going to be, you know, a tremendous event and a tremendous like a celebratory event for the city of Oakland, proving what Oakland had accomplished uh, in that period of time. And then proving what we've been saying from the beginning, that baseball is not going anywhere, uh, no matter what um, the other team, uh, as Brian describes it, might want to do. That is awesome. So, yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and what follows is essentially 48 home games in June, July and August. And you know, and, and it's, it's six games a week. We play every day, but Monday we're on the road half the time. And our, you know, when we're at home, like Paul said, it's going to be like 48, you know, block parties around a baseball game and kind of thematically or programmatically, the way we're looking at it is like the first season is kind of a love letter to Oakland. So um, we will be releasing a, a, like a programming calendar shortly. So you can get a taste of what some of the, what some of the theme nights are, but it really indexes heavily on community engagement and partnerships with various community groups showcasing what Oakland's all about. Yeah, that is awesome. So, I mean, I would say to those of you who are in the Bay Area or if you've got travel that's going to bring you through the Bay Area this summer, uh, this is something to go check out. This is something to just, I think, see. And I mean, if you've never, I think there's something glorious with just watching baseball at this level is exciting. Um, you're going to have people who are really uh, pouring their hearts out on the field. I think I'm looking forward to a fan environment that I think is going to be extraordinary. I think it's got, actually, I love the fact that it's unaffiliated because I think that you don't have to worry about a player like really popping off and then call, then getting called up 
to to the uh, although actually the Oko days send people down when they pop off. So you know the the uh, um sorry I, I gotta stop mentioning the other team, but the um you know you, the fact that we're gonna be able to follow these players all the way through the season and that the you know kids are gonna be able to learn their stories and you know what their journey was and I, I just think it's gonna be so energizing. Uh, and I, I gotta tell you, I got my I got my uh, opening night tickets. Very stoked. I did the same a couple hours ago. I actually, are there still tickets left? Because I bet those are just about full. Um, th- 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 there are. Um, there are still 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 uh, tickets left. So if folks uh, want to go uh, get tickets for opening day, you can through our website at oaklandballers uh, dot com. You know, we do expect that o- that opening day will be a sellout, but it's not yet. So there's you know time yeah, for don't people delay. To go. Don't delay. Yeah, because that they really just went on sale very recently, and and they almost certainly will sell out. And Adam, I'm looking really looking forward to to taking in a ball game there with you oh, this yeah. summer. It's gonna um, be great. It's gonna be great. Um, and Paul and Brian, I, I cannot thank you enough. I mean, I think that, you know, I can't thank you enough for what you're doing for, for the community, for, for baseball. I think you're giving everyone something to be excited about and look forward to. And then the fact that you're doing it in this, just, I, I mean, just absolutely impossible situation of having to start, not just one team, but two and I mean, having to do it with, again, such incredible time bounds. I mean, this is uh, as a, you know, kind of as your fellow entrepreneurs, like it's, it's an incredibly inspiring story and it's yellow. Uh, it is. It really is. Um, and then thank you also for, for agreeing to be on our, our, our crazy <laughs> podcast. You, although actually, if you start a Bowers podcast, I'm going to be an avid listener to that thing, man. Uh, I, I like, you got to get like an inside you, Bowers you podcast. Want, you want to start a Bowers podcast. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. You definitely should. I think that, so here, here's okay. As long as we're not offering free advice, I would, lo- I think a Bowers podcast is in particular, there's so much that happens inside of baseball that people don't see and appreciate that the players and the manager staff and so on know. And I think that there are so many that, that in the MLB system, I think that players are so discouraged from, from saying anything and any, and like anyone, everyone lives in fear. They live in fear of being sent down. They live in fear of, of pissing people off. And, you know, you've got a culture that is really uplifting and I, I would love to have you capture some of that. I would love to get these stories of some of these players. And I, I mean, anyway, I'm going to be a, if, if, and when you start a podcast, um, I'm going to be an avid. Or in the meantime, time. let's get to how I built this. Oh, how I built this with Yoakum Bowers would be great. Huge. All right, Guy Raz, if you're listening. Guy Raz, yeah, we're, we're not you, Kevin Roos. You no. uh, keep walking. <laughs> nope. <laughs> well, Paul and Brian, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, you're going to have, uh, you know, when Steve and I started Oxide, we, I, I, I had this kind of crazy idea that we would have like an Oxide box at the Coliseum. And, I was surprised at how much the loss of that future that doesn't exist yet. So we haven't, you know, we're not there yet as a company by a long shot, but when they announced they were leaving, I realized that I was like mourning for this future that I, that I wasn't going to have. And it was really, you know, upsetting. And it was just in so many different dimensions. Right. And now I'm like, no, no, we are going to have, it's going to be, we're, we're going to have the ballers box. Uh, ballers box. We're going to have, we're going to take, if you like, if you buy an oxide rack, we're going to take you to a ballers game. You're coming to a ballers game right. on the house. We're going to have a, uh, this is, we're excited to, to head over there to Monday historic park, historic room Monday park and take in the block party and watch some great baseball with what's going to be incredible energy. We don't have boxes. We're not that kind of team, but we do, we can do experiential things for groups. So if you want to bring don't, don't worry, out, we're not, we're actually, we're, we're not, we're, we're not, yeah. when we said boxes, we, we need met, met, yeah. we're, not, boxes. We're, not, we're not fancy like that, but, but we love to have you at games and we, what we trade, we trade in fanciness. We can, uh, exchange for accessibility and and being able to touch and feel the product and we're excited we're excited to have you and thank you for having us on the podcast it's, uh, it's been fantastic you bet all right awesome all right let's go ballers can't wait uh, thanks so much guys see you at the park <laughs>